Amen. Um, how many of you guys love to take a trip? Any, any vacationers? I love a good trip. How many of you would say, I really don't get to take vacations all that much? Not as much as what I would like to take a vacation. I love taking trips. I love going out of town. Um, any mission trip? Anybody love to go on a missions trip? Like, okay, you're like, mm-mm. Anybody would like to go on a missions trip? Okay, so I'm just gonna throw this out there. In September, I think it's September 16th to the 23rd, uh, we're gonna be taking a missions trip to Guatemala um, to visit one of uh, a, a pastor friend of mine, Chad Bader. And so we're only taking about 10 to 12 people, maybe. So just put that on your prayer list if you would like to go. Um, I believe it's gonna be amazing. And so um, just throwing that out there for vacations and trips. But anyway, moving on. Here's what I don't love about vacations and about taking trips and going out of town is the stops that sometimes come with those. Now, not fun stops. Um, this past November, my wife and I, um, David Nelms, which will be here in a few weeks, with the Timothy Initiative um, in Florida, they had a global partner weekend. They invited us to come down. And so we're driving down there, and there's this old, like, almost 100-year gas station there, and they've turned it into, like, a big, giant orange they, it was in Florida, so they had orange everything, like orange, orange, orange. That was a fun place to stop. So I'm not talking about little interesting places to stop. I'm talking about on a vacation, something happens, uh, and, and I'm not even talking like traffic jams or wrecks or detours when the car breaks down. We just, we don't like that type of stuff, right? We want to get to our destination, especially when we're on vacation. So there's those type of trips that we can take in life, Right? There are other types of trips that you can be on. <laughs> that sounds so weird to say that because you're like, are you gonna talk about drugs, Chris? No, I'm not talking about that. There's other types of trips that we go on. Um, weight loss, anybody like wanna admit that? First service was like, I'm not admitting that I, I've been on a weight loss journey, Chris. That's, you're judging me already. So you don't have to raise your hand, but many of us in this room have decided to shed a couple pounds and you're on this journey. You've got a destination to lose weight only to like have a stop or get stuck and you come to an abrupt halt for maybe six weeks or six months, who am I fooling, six years, right? It's like, it's difficult and you, you lose a few pounds and then only to like stop, it's horrible. So maybe there's a trip that you're on weight loss. Here's another one, maybe yours, you've been on a journey of love. Any single people in the room? All right, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> She's like, come on. <laughs> I love you. So a journey of love, right? And we, we set out for a destination to be in a relationship only to have some type of a, 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 to get stuck or the proverbial car breaks down and you never necessarily find that relationship or that love that you're looking for. It's as if on your journey you hit a wall and you came to a complete stop. So when I talk about this wall, because we've all had these walls where just everything comes to a screeching halt, and I'm not talking about like, a, like something that's a minor thing. Like you come home one day and your wife speaks to you like harshly and it hurts your feelings and like you're like, oh, I'm just going through so many trials and tribulations. No, like that's just day-to-day -day stuff. I'm not talking about your, your kids mess up in school and you have to deal with the teacher and you're like, I just wish my life is so difficult, I wish I didn't have to talk with the teacher. Maybe your roof has a leak in it, your homeowner insurance won't pay for it. Not those type of things. I'm talking about hitting a wall in your life and like totaling your car type stuck in your walk with Jesus. An example of that would be maybe someone in your family is diagnosed with cancer and they aren't given long to live and this is the third person this year in your family that's passed away. That's a wall. That's not a little traffic jam. That's something that stops you in your tracks. Maybe, maybe yours as you come home one day, you've been married 15, 20 years and your spouse looks at you and says, by the way, I'm leaving you today. Have a nice life. That's a wall. That's different. We're talking about things that bring us to a complete Halt. Maybe you lose your job, you get behind all your bills, you lose your house, there's a potential of losing your car. Some of you in this room have been through some of these things. Hitting a wall is a place where we question everything. Have you been there? Where you, something happens in your life and it just shakes you to your core and sometimes even spiritually, your walk with God. We look for answers, but it doesn't seem like there are any. It's a place where it doesn't seem like there's any hope, 
only despair. As I look back through my life, I've had a few of those things that I can go back to. Hitting a wall reminds each one of us that we have limits. Do you guys know that you have limits? We all have limits. It's where we come to the end of ourselves or the end of our rope, as some would say. And arriving at this place on our journey with Jesus is also inevitable. It isn't if it happens, but it's simply when it happens, when we hit this wall. It's a place in our lives that we see that we are not sufficient. We're not enough. I think everybody wants to be self-sufficient, or at least my generation did. Now in 2023, as long as mom and dad are self-sufficient, we're good, right? Is that, too, is that too close to home? Okay, all right, sorry. Got real quiet. They're like, all the college kids are like, I can't help it, I don't make money, right? No judgment here. I'll strike that one, we'll delete that one later. We all kind of want to be self-sufficient, but we're not enough. And if we're followers of Jesus that are not just spiritually mature, but also emotionally healthy, then that will lead us to also question, God, are you enough? So just take a moment, think in your life, have there been times where you've questioned God? God, are you really that good? Because I don't feel you. God, I don't hear you, and it's not for a lack of me wanting it. God, where are you? God, what are you up to and what are you doing? Because I don't see any good that can come out of this situation. I think many of us have been there, and I think it's vitally important for us to understand why it is that we have walls in our life, times in our life. And thank God that life is not just one train wreck after another, right? There are mountaintops and there are valleys, but there are reasons why each one of us in this room hit different walls in our life. Is there a purpose for them? If we don't understand, most of us will never be able to continue on the journey that God has called us to because we'll simply stall out. If you're like me, it's just easier to run from the pain. Anybody love pain? For being honest, we spend our whole lives like, give me a paper cut, I'll show you how much I hate pain. You're like, I, is the, I hate pain. Whenever I'm in pain, I want something to ease the pain. I want something to relieve me of the pain. So sometimes we run from it, or worse, we hide from it. And I'm not just talking about physical, guys. I'm talking about deep spiritual pain. And I just want this, I didn't say this in the first service, but the amount of new people that we have coming to Crossroads Church is pretty astronomical. And do you know what, well, the kids are having fun back there. You hear that? That makes me want to go hang out in the kids' church. Like, ts, ts, ts. Maybe it'll keep you awake. I don't know. So I don't even know what was I saying. Amount of new people coming to Crossroads Church. You know, that's, that's going to annoy me. At staff meeting, I'm going to talk to them. I'm like, turn it down just a little. I'm a squirrel. Okay. No, great. No, 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 no. Let them. Let them. Okay, good. I'm like, please let those kids rock out to Jesus. By the way, if you've got kids back there, they are learning some Jesus, some kind of hard. So um, you can't separate Jesus and joy, just FYI. But the amount of new people that are coming to Crossroads, and when I have conversations with you, you know, like the number one thing that everybody has in common? Serious church hurt in their life. That's the number one topic when I hang out with people and I just get to know their story. You know what they almost always say? I come from a background where the last church that I was at did me dirty or, or they've got some serious hurt or for whatever reason. And, and I just wanna say this up front, we're not perfect and there's a good chance that we'll probably hurt you too because we are not perfect, guys. This is not a perfect church. If you're looking for it, it's not here, but we want you to come. But we all, we all come to the end of ourselves and it's very important that we don't run from our pain hide from it, pretend that it's not there, and hope that it goes away, because God desires to transform us through the pain and through the confusion of whatever wall that it is that you're going through. So today, I don't have any points, but I've got something that you can write down if you're, if you're taking notes. I believe with all of my heart that in life, there are one or two reasons that you personally 
hit a wall or face a wall in your life. Number one, you ready? Write it down. It could be that it's a consequence of sin. Some of us in this room may have hit walls in our lives where our faith comes to a screeching halt and we question everything because God doesn't seem like he's there and it could be possibly that it is a consequence of our sin. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 11. I want you to see this in scripture. And if you're here today and you're not used to like turning in a Bible, maybe you don't own one, um, there should be a Bible underneath the seat in front of you. I would encourage you, grab that, turn in the Old Testament. If you don't have a Bible and you've never been in the Bible, you're probably like, what is the Old Testament? So there's a table of contents up front. This is so cool. So our student ministry on Wednesday nights, we have a bunch of, I don't know, 50, 60 middle schoolers that don't really care about God. Some of them do, but a lot of them don't. They're just here to pick up a guy or a girl and hang out and have fun. Like, we get it. But here's what we started doing. Does anybody remember that grew up in church sword drills? Anybody know what a sword drill is? Not like an actual sword, but you have a Bible, and here's what we started doing. We're having contests where we get them to actually grab a Bible, and they're like, what is this thing called a book? It's not electronic. It doesn't plug in, right? And so I'll give them a passage of Scripture. I'll say, John 1, 1, and they have to repeat it back to me. John 1, 1, and then I say, charge. And the first person to find it and stand up gets to read it and they win something. That's what we're going to do right now. Second Samuel, you ready? I'm kidding. All the adults are like (laughs) profusely sweating. You're like, oh, please don't. So we have to teach them. There's a table of contents. And if you don't know where second Samuel is, that's okay. At the very, it should be on, I think page two of your, the Bible that's in the seats. It's a table of contents. Find second Samuel and then find it in the Bible. So you can follow along. We'll also have the scriptures around the room. But while you're turning there, if you're not there, King David faced a few walls in his life. And you're like, who is this guy, King David? Well, he was the second king of the nation of Israel. And he faced numerous walls throughout his life. And the one we're gonna look at today was a consequence of his sin. And I would love to say that all the walls that we hit in our lives, it's just God doing something amazing. But often it's because we have sin in our lives. So 2 Samuel chapter 11 We're gonna look verses one through five. Here's what scripture says. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. And it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, uh, is, is not this, is this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the, the wife, the wife, David? She's married of Uriah the Hittite. Verse four, so David sent messengers and and took her and she came to him and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house. Look at verse five, and the woman conceived and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. Now, in scripture, we do see that David is called a man after God's own heart, but can we all agree that's not after God's own heart? Just because you're called a man after God's own heart does not mean that you live 110% of the time as a man after God's own heart. I hope we can all agree that what David did was horribly wrong. Bathsheba was a married woman. To make matters worse, David tried to cover it. He tried to cover it, and when that didn't work, and listen, for the sake of time, we don't have time to go through the whole story, but this is a great passage that you guys can continue reading throughout the week. And so David, in order to try to cover this because he wants it to go away, this wall that he's hit, now he's, there's a woman who is married that he has gotten pregnant. He takes that woman's husband and puts him on the front lines of the battle where the fighting was the fiercest. That's a sure death sentence. David knew what he was doing and Uriah the Hittite was killed. So David's an adulterer and he's a murderer And let's turn to 2 Samuel chapter 12. 
We're going to start in verse 15. Then Nathan, prophet of God, went to his house, and the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and he became sick. And look at David's response. As many of you would, parents, when your kids get sick, when your child has something wrong, what do you do? You cry out to God, don't you? Uh, There's nothing that you would let stand in your way of going before God on behalf of your child. This is... This is Parenting 101. David therefore sought God on behalf of the child and David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. And the elders of his house stood beside him to raise him from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. I have to correct myself on the next verse. The first service, I actually, I don't know, my eyesight's going like I have glasses. I said on the 17th day, (laughs) <laughs> and apparently like half of the congregation was like, that's wrong, that's wrong, right? Like everybody came up to let me know. Thank you guys, appreciate you keeping me accountable. Praise God for that. You're paying attention, right? So it's the seventh day, just making sure. Okay, on verse 18, on the seventh day, you see what happened? The child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, behold, while the child was yet alive, we spoke to him and he did not listen to us. How then can we say to him, the child is dead? Do you see right here? He may do himself some harm. Often a telltale sign that you're at a wall. You're at kind of a spiritual dead end. One of the things that comes is, harming ourselves. Think about the pastors or maybe followers of Jesus that you've read in the news that have committed suicide. There's a wall they hit in their life and it was just too big for them. And they realize that I'm not sufficient. I'm not enough. And God, I don't necessarily hear you right now. I don't see what you're doing. And God, there's no way out. Even these men were concerned that a man after God's own heart would do himself harm. Some of you here today might be able to relate. Your sin, it might not be 100% of the time, but there are times in your life where your sin, the wall that you're facing is the consequence of your sin. It's important for us as followers of Jesus to take inventory to sometimes sit and be still, to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us and call those things out. But if it's not sin, the second way, the second reason you might be hitting a wall in your life is simply this. God has allowed it to happen. There's no other way around it. It's either a consequence of sin or it's simply something that God has allowed to happen in your life. There's another story in the Bible, in the book of Job. I'd like you to turn there. If you have no idea where that's at, you do hopefully remember where the table of contents is. If you're just opening your Bible, Psalms is a really big book. Just flip backwards from Psalms until you hit Job. It's right there before Psalms. And as you're turning there, Job was a righteous man. And I believe the same thing could be said about him, that he was a man after God's own heart. God's hand of protection, he was a righteous man. And most scholars believe that within the span of eight minutes, his life was turned completely upside down. And we're gonna see it right here in scripture. But his wall that he hit was not a consequence of sin. So if you're there, Job chapter one, we're gonna start in verse eight. I hope, do you guys use your imagination when you read scripture? Do you picture it? I don't know if they do now because kids now don't have an imagination, but man, I had an imagination when I was a young kid and I try to remain childlike because I wanna have that imagination. So I hope you picture these things. So imagine God in heaven or whatever that looked like at this time and Satan's coming to and fro, depending if you're reading the King James Version, to and fro, that would be the version. And so he's coming in and out and he's having a conversation with God. Satan and God are still talking. 
You're like, I thought they were allergic. I didn't think they, no, they, they talk. So look at verse eight. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth, blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Whoa, God is like, hey, Satan, I know you're, he's the great accuser, right? Can you imagine God saying, hey, have you considered my servant Rebecca? Wow, insert your name. Would God say to Satan, have you considered my servant Keith? That there is none like them on the earth, upright, fears God and turns away from evil? Wouldn't, shouldn't that be all of our desire? Amen? But if you read on the story, you're like, I want that, but not what else comes after that because like, this, is, this story gets really interesting real quick. So yes, I want that, but God, please don't take that hedge of protection over, off of me. Well, let's see what it goes on to say in verse nine. Satan answered him. Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for no reason? Like what, he just all of a sudden fears you for no reason, God? No, verse 10. Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has? On every side, you have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. Verse 11, but stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. Challenge accepted. I love this. Can you, can you like to have a box of popcorn and to be watching this back and forth, like this is the best Netflix you could ever watch. What is gonna happen? This is amazing. Are you there? And it's interesting too, when God said, if you consider my servant Job, Satan knew he's a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. He already knew because he had seen that Job was protected. You don't think he had circled Job's hedge of protection quite a few times looking for God to release that? Oh, 110%, he was aware. He knew right away, yes, I've considered him because you've got a hedge of protection around him. Not only that, but around all that he has because I've tried. So challenge accepted. Look at verse 13. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And so Job, right? Verse 14, and there came a messenger to Job and said, and like I can only imagine the frantic from this servant's voice. The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabians fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. You talk about a wall. All of a sudden, Job gets some really bad news. Can you imagine him just going about his normal day-to-day -day life? Maybe you've been there. Maybe you were having a great time, you were in a good season, and all of a sudden, you got some really bad news, and your world starts to crumble. This is what happens with Job. The crazy thing was, while that servant was telling him, here comes another servant, verse 16. While he was yet speaking, there's a servant telling Job, all, all heck is breaking loose in your life. Here comes another servant that says in verse 16, there came another and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consume them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. So Job is just receiving this information, trying to process that. Here comes another servant, and he's trying, now he's hearing like, oh, what is going on? Can you imagine the chaos in that moment? While this one is speaking, while this one is speaking, look at this verse. Verse 17. While he was yet speaking, there came another. This is the third one and said the Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword and I alone have escaped to tell you. He's losing everything, guys, in the matter of a couple of minutes. One guy's talking, he thinks it's more important than what he's saying, but he doesn't realize what he's saying is just as important and now this third servant, and guess what? It doesn't stop there. Verse 18, while he was yet speaking, 
there came another and said, this is number four. He's lost at this point all of his earthly possessions. Verse 18, there came another and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young people, your children, and they are dead and I alone have escaped to tell you. Can it get any worse? Would we all agree this is a bad day? Heaven forbid that happened to any of you. But some of you have had very similar stuff happen to you in your life. You might not have lost all your earthly possessions. You might not have lost all your kids at one time, but it was just as a big deal to you because we all hit walls. And some of those walls are really deep and they're really dark. And both of these men loved God. It wasn't for a lack of love for God. They hit a wall in their journey, but the wall came for, from different reasons. Can we all agree? So today, I want you to be aware that your wall that you're facing, and if you haven't hit a wall yet in life, praise God, praise God, it's coming. If, you've got, if you're breathing and you have a pulse, you are going to hit a wall, and we need to do our best to make sure that it is not a consequence of sin, because I wouldn't want both. Because there are gonna be things that God allows you to go through, allows things to happen in your life that don't make sense to you. So, good news, whether your wall is from sin or whether your wall is simply because God allowed it. You know what our greatest temptation is gonna be? To quit. That's our greatest temptation. To give up or worse, I'll just stay like I am. And if we're not careful, we'll never grow, we'll never mature in our walk with Jesus and we'll stay the exact same thing. I would love to say that your wall only takes a couple of days. Some of you, it takes weeks. Some of you, your wall might take months and some of you, your wall might take years. Hate to be the bearer of bad news. I don't know how long it will take. But they're not permanent. In title, the, the, the title of chapter four in the book that we've been working through, it's called Journey Through the Wall. I hope that you guys are enjoying those books. I hope that you're actually reading it because it started to unpack. It's, it's made a revolutionary impact in my personal life, in the lives of our staff. And I know that many of you have shared some things with me that you've been realizing and connecting the dots with to help you in your walk with Jesus. So praise God for that. But when it talks about this wall that we hit our, Jesus' desire for us when we hit this wall isn't for us to try to find a way around it. It isn't even for us to try to jump over the wall. No, his desire is for, to help us go through the wall. And if you're like me and you're a picture type person, how can I pass through a wall? It doesn't make sense. So what I'd like to think of the wall, I'd like to think of it more of a filter. You guys know what a filter is? I'm glad you asked. A filter is something that is used to remove impurities or unwanted material. Filters. I love to go swimming. Anybody ready for some warmer weather? If it is not gonna snow, North Carolina, get on. I'm just saying, I want snow, but it's not gonna happen. It is February the 26th and it ain't happened yet. Just get on out and let's get some warmer weather because I love to swim. When I am swimming in a pool, there is nothing worse than jumping into a swimming pool in dirty, unfiltered water. Can I get an amen? Not to be gross, but you're swimming and you get like this patch of hair that just drapes across your face. Praise God, hopefully it doesn't hit your lip or something. You're swimming and you look down if you can even open your eyes because of the tremendous amount of chlorine and you're like, man, there's a lot of leaves and you're like, nope, those are dead frogs. I don't enjoy that. What I do love is swimming in some deliciously filtered pool water and even that's weird to say deliciously. You know what I'm saying. Guys, in the same way that filters remove impurities, Jesus desires to do a work in you and in me. Jesus desires 
for us to pass through the wall. And I want you to see the wall, which is typically painful, confusing, dark, overwhelming, hopeless. And Jesus wants us to see that as a filter because Jesus is trying to remove certain things from our lives. It's a beautiful picture. He wants to work through us. He wants to purge, if you will, our desires and our affections because we all have unhealthy attachments to things in this world. I don't care who you are. I don't care how super spiritual spiritual you are. We all have unhealthy attachments to the things of this world because this world is not our home. And Jesus desires to help us go through these really dark times to purify us. Proverbs 17, three, this is a good one, write it down. Here's what scripture says. The crucible is for silver and the furnace is for gold and the Lord tests the hearts. When you think about a furnace for gold, they would take these furnaces and they would put gold in them and they would heat them up and the gold would become liquid and you get it hot enough and the imperfections start to rise to the surface. You know what they would do? They would scrape the imperfections off and they would have a more pure, finer material. And it's the same way with you and I. Listen to Isaiah 48, 10. Behold, I have refined you. This is what God wants to do in all of our lives. He wants to refine us. But scripture says, but not as silver. This isn't about removing dross from silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. Part of the the discipleship process, if you will, us following Jesus, part of that process is a church word called sanctification. It's a refining process. It's God doing a work in our lives where he removes more and more of us and replaces us with more and more of him. Isn't that what this world needs? Less and less of us and more and more and more and more and more of him. And in our darkest moments, when you and I hit a wall where we are stuck in our faith, Here's what I want to tell you today. You are not alone. It's easy to say that right now because I'm not at a wall, but I have been this past year where I questioned everything. I questioned my salvation. I questioned my calling as a pastor. I questioned my friends. I questioned God. I questioned every single thing you could question. Your pastor did that. Praise God. Let's find another church, right? Like, I'm just being real. I've hit a wall. And in that moment, it was very hard for me to believe that I was not alone because I've never felt more alone in my life. And you know what actually led to? Suicidal thoughts. I am 46 years old and I have always thought, just being honest and open and transparent, I've always thought it was foolish and selfish for people to ever think about ending their life until this past year. But we have an enemy and he comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. Have you been in a wall before? where all of a sudden you know the church things to say and you know the scripture and you know the words and you're like, God, where are you? I've never felt more alone. Hindsight though, now that I've been through that purging, if you will, where God revealed some things, some unearthly attachments in my life and I've become a more pure, far from where I need to be, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. You you know that kid's church song? Took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be because he is still working on me. So I'm not where I need to be, but I'm more like him now because of what I've gone through. And I look back and I say, I wasn't alone. It seemed like it because I didn't hear from him as much, but he was there. And I just want to encourage you today, wherever you're at, if you're not at a wall, if you've never been through one, just be prepared. When it comes, no, you are not alone. It's in the moments where we can't see God, where we question everything about our faith, and God in those moments is wanting to do an amazing work in you. 
and he wants to use the pain that you experience, and I'm setting us up for next week because pain is such a beautiful thing. It lets us know there's a problem, so please come back. He wants to use the pain for his glory, or as the way the book puts it, this is God's way of rewiring and purging our affections and our passions that we might delight in his love and enter into a richer, fuller communion with him. Isn't that what we all want as followers of Jesus? We want a richer, a fuller communion with our Savior. So today, as I wrap up, turn with me to Psalms 23. Psalm 23, probably one of the most popular passages in Psalms. This is often quoted at funerals. I think maybe at a wedding or two, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, right? Like, I'm kidding. Is that, that's not appropriate, I guess. Like, Chris, we get married in love. I'm just saying. Psalms 23. You know, David hit a wall when he, after he killed Goliath, he's supposed to be the next king, Right? And he was under Saul for a very long time and Saul got jealous and Saul would actually take spears and try to pin David to the wall. You talk about a wall and then David actually ends up having to run for his life from Saul. That's a, that's a wall. Some people say it might have been a year to eight years or more that David was on the run. We don't know for sure. Some people speculate. That's a long wall. Then David, which we just read about, he he has it a child with another woman and then commits murder on top of that. that can we all, that's a, that's a wall. And then later on, David's good and David says, hey, I wanna build you a temple, God. And God's like, nope. What do you mean? I thought we were good. There's walls all around us that we're all facing. So David is writing in chapter 23, he's actually writing of his gratitude towards God. David is grateful that God is loving and present in our painful and in our dark times. Look at it with me, Psalm 23, verse one. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall not want. Do you see the picture of a shepherd? What's a shepherd's primary job? Constant care, constant protection. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters, not rushing chaos like rapids, still, beautiful, relaxing, calming waters. Oh, verse three. If you don't know this, guys, highlight it. He restores my soul. Somebody needs to hear that today. I don't know what you're going through. God does. And you're not alone. And you might feel like God isn't there. You might, you might even question that I'm saying it right now, but based upon life experience and what God has done in my life, you are not alone. He will restore your soul, but we have to let him do the hard work. We have to let the Holy Spirit do the hard work of letting us purge ourselves from some of those earthly distractions and desires that we cling to so much. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of what? Why would he do that? For his name's sake. David would know in great detail what a shepherd does because as a, a little boy, you know, what, you know what David did? He was a shepherd. And in the same way that a shepherd would lead and guide and direct his sheep, we must see that this is what Jesus does for us as well. Jesus wants to lead you, not around that difficult pain, not over the difficult pain. He doesn't want you to pretend like it never happened and don't ever deal with it. No, he says, we're gonna do the hard work. You're not getting out of this easy. Why? Because I love you too much. Jesus loves you too much. He'll accept you exactly how you are today, but he loves you too much to allow you to stay the same. He wants to go through the pain with you. When it talks about he makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside still waters, does that sound like somebody who's stuck at a wall? I'd be like, oh, woe is me, take me from my misery. Something different here. David is saying that there is an abundance of what he needs and this is what God as our shepherd does. This is what he does. He will always provide what 
we need, not just in our times of abundance, but even more so in times that are dark. Listen to verse four as we wrap this up. Even though I walk over, does it say that? Even though I walk around, even though I sidestep the pain, no, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what is our, what is our response, what should our response be? I will fear no evil. And in my darkest times, guys, I experienced the most fear that I've ever experienced before in my life, which lets me know I'm not where I need to be. And I need a greater dependence on my Savior. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And we will face dark walls throughout life's journeys, but it is often in the darkest times where we experience the love and presence of God, and listen to how he ends with the last two verses. Number five, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. In the presence of my enemies, I want God to come through and clean house. Can I get an amen? Wipe them off the face of the earth. He said stuff similar to that throughout Psalms. But here, God is literally saying, hey, I need you to take a break, take a breath, I've got you, I'm the good shepherd, no matter how you feel, no matter what you see, I'm cooking for you. What? I'm making a table. You know what it signifies there? If you do a little research, here's what it's saying. God is arranging and setting things in order for your life. Think about a table spread. You ever go to your grandma's for lunch? She ever just throw crap on the table? Not my grandma. I mean, she, she did it up, 85 types of sides to eat along with a protein, right? Come on now, somebody's got a grandma that's cooked like that. Like, mine just gave me bologna. I like, a spread. God is setting things in order in your life and in mine. In the middle of the darkest times that you face, you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Do you see your dark wall, your dark times in your life as overflowing? This is who God desires to help us become. Because our joy and our victory is not based upon our circumstances. Guys, this is, this is who we are and God wants to remove it all, strip it away from us. Verse six, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's in these dark moments where God begins to replace our doubts and our fears with his love as more and more of us is replaced with more and more of him. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, I just wanna say this quickly to you as we end. If you're in a wall today, if you're at a wall and you're in a dark 